very interested in following up on it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How are you? I'm good. I'm so I work out with a trainer on Wednesday, so she just oh. really does her best to do me in. Which is good. Yeah. Which is good. So. That's what you're paying for, but you're like, why am I paying for this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I love it. I've been training for a while. And That's good. It's, uh, I always really enjoy it, but it's a good for me to Yeah. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Yeah, what's going on? Uh, not much. It was, yeah. it was nice stopping by Judge Lynch Chambers. So oh, yeah, cool. So, yeah, so it was good talking to him. Okay, good, good, good. I could kind of sense some tension between him and his clerk, but I think if I didn't know about it, I probably wouldn't have thought much about it. Yeah. But just like little things like. It's such an intense relationship. Yeah. And what was the primary source of friction again? The source of friction? Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, you got some insight about this, like, single clerk and working really hard. Right, whatever. which I knew, you yeah. know, when I was interviewing, I was like, this is going to be double the PDMs, but just, I which is Which is significant, but you're, I mean, you're on top of stuff, so I think you'll handle that really well. <laughs> um, but that's significant. Yeah. yeah, but then just the, I don't, I don't know why, if it's just a personality thing. Mm -hmm. What's your personality? I don't know. I just have met her once at the holiday lunch, and okay. she seemed really nice. Okay, so yeah, you just yeah. You know. Yeah, it's not like I like was like, well, I, mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like I was just hearing all this from Julie, who's mm -hmm. her friend, and, right. and right, then right, right. it seems like she's like being pretty open about it, which is interesting. Cause well, I, feel like she's, I mean, I think Julie's her close friend, and Julie and I are friends, so Julie just wanted to put me on notice. But then, yeah, Alexis had gone out to lunch with. Judge Fox's clerks because Alexis had a recent intern and Nancy, Judge Love's yeah. current clerk, yeah. came and told Alexis. So Alexis mentioned it to me and I'm like, that's weird that Nancy would tell Alexis. She just that's not a great decision. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a really small town. It's super small. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, Nancy seemed really nice. But I, just, I don't, and it wasn't anything huge. It's just like he didn't refer to her by name when he was talking about her. Mm -hmm. He was just in my clerk and he mm -hmm. was like talking about my story to me and he said, um, I have no idea what my current clerk's doing after this. Like, I don't know what she's done. I'm like, it seems like you would know what she was applying. That's, that's really rough. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, I saw, you know, when I clerked on the Vermont Supreme Court, the woman who was clerking for the Chief Justice was, you know, really struggling. Um, but I feel like her personality really exacerbated it, you know. I mean, it's the thing, and I kind of want to talk about some of this today, but it's, it's, it, you know, you think about how much hierarchy there is in legal education, the kind of demeanor and stuff like that, um, and it depends, you know, from class to class, but you're really in a subordinate position with a judge, and for some people that's the first time they've been in that kind of work in a situation, and it takes, I think, a certain type of personality to accept that subordinate position and still, you know, maintain your own integrity and speak up when you need to or not. But it's really, it's just, it's really, it, it's almost anachronistic. I mean, the judge law clerk position is kind of from another era, you know. And even like by the law firm, it's very hierarchical, but it's just really nothing close to yeah. that, you know. And I was thinking about Justice Hobbs and sort of. Um, <laughs> Wasn't that an interesting contrast in personality? That was great. That's great. <laughs> uh, but sort of on, this, on some level, this sort of casual, like, down-home Western kind of demeanor or whatever. But um, but I'm guessing that he's not, you know, a casual person, so to speak, you know. Only a nice senior, and it's just nerve-wracking to talk to him. Mm -hmm. But he's casual and, and conversational in the sense that he'll initiate conversation and keep it going. Mm -hmm. But definitely has that kind of like academic like teaching demeanor mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. He also mm -hmm. does a lot of public speaking, so I think that may mm -hmm. contribute to it. But. Mm -hmm. Well, I think especially so. It was what was interesting to me with Justice Marquez is that she uses language like a generationally different language. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Which I thought was really interesting. Um, but that you know some of these other judges who have been on the bench for a decade or more. You think about well, how do they conceptualize it themselves, right? How do they conceive of themselves, um, uh, and sort of how do they interact with other people? And they really interact with people, whether it's law clerks or attorneys or staff people in the courthouse who are, you know, so again, subordinate to them. 
Um, and, you know, how does that sort of shape their, their sense of themselves and, and how they interact with people going forward, you know, just all that kind of intangible stuff to be cognizant of. Yeah. When I interned at the Supreme Court, Justice Hobbs like came in with his intern because we were like in these intern chambers, which was just like cubicles, and he came in with his intern and he was like, "Oh, this is your cubicle. Is everything set up? Do you have like pens?" And I thought it was so nice. <laughs> My justice said like four words to me the whole time. She just was more hands off, mm -hmm. and she was very nice and respectful, but she just was like, "Like, thank you for your work." And I worked mostly with the clerks, yeah. so I thought it was cool that Justice Hobbs like. Like got to know the interns and like. My opinion he is he does take mentoring very seriously. Yeah, which yeah. I think is great. Yeah, yeah. No, that is a really nice quality. Yeah. Um, well, I know Alexis can't make it today. She had a plumbing issue. Oh. Um, but I was gonna wait. Let's see. Hey. Yeah, sorry. Okay, you have to tell me like why are you so obsessed with taking a picture of the locker room? But of all the things to take a picture of. <laughs> oh, I wanted to do the exact same thing. I thought this looked really cool. <laughs> I was thinking about today too, I was like, why don't we all get a picture with Justice Marquez? Like, that would have been probably really cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's you know, I think about who would have had a camera to hold it, someone would have stepped. It's, you know, it's tricky. I mean, they are sort of celebrities, but on the other hand, you don't like necessarily treat them that way. I don't know. I don't know. It's tricky. Um, okay, so I was mentioning Alexis can't join us today. She's got, uh, well, I'm going to tell her, she's got a plumbing issue at home. Her pipes. Mm. Oh, I have a friend oh, that had the same thing at home. Oh, jeez. Yeah. She's a homeowner, too, so I'm sure there's no one else to do with it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's bad. So, uh, but if she contacts one of you for notes, just so you could share with her. I mean, today's session is going to be pretty casual. Um, mostly, by the way, I do have a little exercise that I want us to do, um, but mostly I want to debrief uh, from our visit to the courthouse and um, talk a little bit about what's coming up, kind of getting on pace in terms of developing your writing. Um, and the, the process sort of involved with doing that. So, uh, first of all, let's talk a little bit about the visit to the court. We might ask you guys to think about some things that you, you know, the takeaways that you had from the visit. Um, what do you guys have to offer? I've got to down some. Okay. Well, the first and foremost, I thought it was confidentiality. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, <laughs> just being rather important. Uh, especially outside of the courthouse, I mean, you don't want to be discussing matters at all. And then, even within the courthouse, as far as the different chambers, uh, yeah. you definitely want clarification from your judge mm -hmm. of who you should be talking to and on what issue. Mm -hmm. So, and what's the, the reason for that? Well, uh, you definitely can't be talking about pending cases right. uh, publicly. Right. Um, I mean, it's a legal code as well, it's a judicial code. And then inside uh, the cases, I mean, you probably only want people that are involved on the case to be sharing information. So what? So let's, this is good to think about. Actually, what are some of the, you know, potential circumstances in which confidentiality would come up? Okay, so that could be between you and, you know, friends, right? Public, spouse, and just you know, there's really no circumstance under which you should talk about pending cases or, you know, the process of reaching a decision in a particular case. Um, and so let's kind of start with like a descriptive purpose of like what is the, the practice in terms of confidentiality and things like that, and then maybe kind of try to think about why that's the case. Because it's something, you know, for me, as a, when I started out as a law clerk, it's just very obvious right away that these were sort of the rules around what you could and couldn't talk about. Um, and I, you know, sort of unquestionably, you know, complied with that. And I'm not in any way, shape, or form suggesting you shouldn't comply, but I think it's interesting to think about why these rules are there, okay? So who else might you interact with? <clears throat> Other clerks? Yeah. Not, not, so your co-clerks, you know, A-okay, <laughs> right? You're, you guys are all on the same team. Um, you know, the clerks, and what, what sense did you all get of the relationship between the justices and the judges? It seemed like she almost kind of yearned that they knew each other a little bit better. Like, uh -huh. Even though the, the, ju the justices might know each other, but I don't think they like go golfing every weekend or anything. Mm -hmm. 
Um, they're not necessarily buddies, right? Yeah, they're not exactly, they don't necessarily have a friendship, but they know each other. Well, and what about that professional relationship? How would you describe that? Or, you know, we're speculating, obviously, to some extent, but... Same team? Opposing teams? I think it varies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought it was interesting when she said that you never want your judge to hear something that they said to you from somebody else. And I thought that's really fascinating, like, yeah. particularly while the judges and justices are deliberating or trying to convince each other of certain things or you yeah. know, what they could compromise on and whatnot, that it's particularly important to, or, or confidentiality is particularly important to. I'm just gonna jot down some notes over here. So for example, if your judge has been sort of deliberating about a position, and talk and it with you, but they want to go into conference presenting a sort of unified front, it would be very disruptive to that process if you were to kind of reveal that. Um, you know, yeah, the relationship between the judges varies. And I think one of the things I really enjoyed about speaking with Justice Marquez is um, I think she has this professional persona, I think I mentioned this in an email to you, but uh, that I really admire, um, which is, you know, she was very candid and open about the core processes, but she never even hinted at sort of factionalism or just a so-and-so always takes this position and you know these people are on the other side or whatever. And um, now what, what she says behind closed doors, not her, but what anyone says behind closed doors, you know, might be a, a different matter. But there's um, this idea of, you know, Diplomacy, I mean, she really emphasized that, I think, on every level, how important diplomacy is and, and sort of, you know, really strategically considering how to approach different issues and to approach relationships. Um, but that that's really kind of necessary in an environment where you have potential conflict, right? So, yeah, again, with other, speaking with other clerks, um, you know, the, and we talked about this particularly with your situation in terms of not having co-clerks, which can be lonely if you really can't talk to other clerks. I mean, generally, what happens in chambers stays in chambers, right? Um, so, um, as pens not really working well here, but um, that's a default rule. So you just have to kind of say to yourself, and this is maybe some of you the first time in your life that you've really thought about work this way. The default is zip it, <laughs> right? And don't talk about work. Um, you know, some exceptions might be if you know, let's say you have your judge um, and another judge are working together on a concurrence or something like that, and you might have a dialogue there. You know, sometimes the Vermont Supreme Court, more when as a staff attorney than a law clerk, I disagree with Justice so-and-so about this. I want you to go talk to him and convince him to agree. You know, I think that's a little bit unusual, and again, definitely probably something more reserved for staff attorneys than for law clerks. But um, there might be, you know, there might be kind of limited areas in which um, you could talk to other clerks, for example, you know, trying to figure out a body of law or something like that. But when it comes to strategy and the relationship with the judge, that's really pretty off limits, okay? Um, and then, you know, same thing for other judges. You don't want to be some kind of sleeper agent, you know, <laughs> talks to the other judge about things. Um, what, a, what other situations might you find? Maybe professors or other attorneys, you know, people who have been mentors. Okay, this is not working. People who have been mentors to you in the past, you might be inclined to want to talk to them a little bit more openly about some things. So it's not to say, um, that you need to not have those relationships. But again, you just need to start sort of with this assumption of confidentiality and really consider you know, one way, one way to, to what's a, what, what is one way, one mechanism you might use to consider whether or not to share something? It's, I mean, I think it's going back to your New York Times thing. Like, if, yeah. if your judge heard that you told someone what they would be. Yeah, that's probably exactly the standard you want to be using. Okay, if your judge was standing right there, would you say that in front of him or mm -hmm. her? Okay. And of course, if you had extraordinary poor judgment in that situation, then that hypothetical wouldn't help much. But um, you know, I think you guys will really you'll really get um, acculturated to this idea of confidentiality pretty pretty early on. But it's just uh, you know, 
to, you don't want to slip up in that area and have your judge be upset with you. And the problem too is a judge who works in this environment all the time, they may forget to explicitly tell you about some of their expectations around confidentiality. So just, I would start with a very, very conservative rule there. And it's, you know, any communication about a case or anything in chambers is an exception that you have to think through and have a logical reason for, okay? Any questions about that? Um, I actually have one kind of related question. Yeah. So say you work on a case as a clerk um, that your judge of assistance signed the opinion, and then later in private practice, like yeah. something with that, like a client or similar issue comes up, would you be unable to represent that client? Yeah, no, that's actually a totally fair because question. Yeah, yeah, because the law is the law, right? The law now doesn't even really matter anymore what was behind the scenes in terms of the opinion developing. Everybody has equal access to the written opinion. Okay. okay. So it's sort of neutral in that sense. Um, you know, later conflicts based on the clerkship. I did practice where I clerked. I did practice here, obviously, you know, after being a staff attorney on the Tenth Circuit. Um, but some judges will say, I will never have my law clerk argue in front of me. Some judges will say, wait for a year, you know, before you can argue in front of them. Um, trying to think of other types of conflicts that might, you know, kind of com come out of that. But definitely not anything involved with working on cases, so to speak, okay? Um, so kind of getting to the why, you know, I was really trying, I was thinking about these two ideas. Um, right, uh, decorum and transparency, how they kind of are a little bit in tension with one another. Uh, and I actually was thinking about it with a photograph, right? So you have to you take the photograph, and of course her natural instinct is like, of course, why not? Mm -hmm. And then she's like, but don't paste, post it on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. um, so transparency is, of course, why can't you take a photograph of that? The decorum is, you know, that it's a sensitive space in a sense because it is behind closed doors. It is where very important conversations happen. Um, and, you know, when you think about confidentiality, confidentiality is a, a barrier to transparency, right? So why, why do we have this confidentiality and this sense of decorum? I think the most important thing is for the court to avoid prejudgment or the appearance of prejudgment. Oh, so, yeah. That until the decision comes out, you know, it should be seen as though the issue has been decided one way or the other. <clears throat> so, okay, well, how about the argument that, well, you know, okay, yes, we want them not only to be impartial, but also to appear impartial. And maybe those are two different things, right? But are you telling me that if we were able to see into chambers and hear the conversations between judge and law clerk, that we would have, you know, discover evidence of lack of, par of impartiality. <laughs> well, I mean, there's always that common knowledge and opinion and experience that you're never going to be able to completely remove something like impartiality. So is hiding that sort of the solution to suggest somehow that judges are kind of, so, you know, coming back to some of the earliest things in the class, are judges sort of these robots who make decisions and without ever think, having an error in the process? I think it helps. And it helps because people will argue, argue more on the merits instead of appealing to personal. Uh, um, interesting. Instead of like so that's sort of, purposes. instead of manipulating process, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of attorneys feel this way. I find it really offensive for whatever reason, but like, oh, Judge so-and-so, you know, she's really into blah de blah you know, and so make an argument about golfing because she loves golfing or whatever. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's ridiculous, but um, it does, so that sort of um, decorum and sort of lack of transparency in some ways pushes you more towards arguing the merits as opposed to, you know, trying to, whatever, you know, trying to um, invade the process of making the, the decision. Do you have a point? I think it's interesting with the transparency that there is this idea of transparency, but then not really, because it's like whatever the judge issues 
as his or her opinion is that's it and they don't want anything else getting out that's why like the conversations are really um, confidential when I was interning for Arguello mm -hmm. um, I asked her if I could use a draft I wrote as a writing sample and she was like if that's not what we that's, if that's not what's on Westlaw you can't use it so then I ended up using the one that was on Westlaw and then I just had to provide a caveat that the clerks and the judge had made some edits but they just don't want any um, of the like previous drafts getting out there yeah that's tricky right so especially if you're a staff attorney you slave away and you write and you write for years and you never, you know, you don't sign your name to anything or whatever. But the whole idea of who writes opinions, you know, do you go around and tell people, oh, I wrote them? <laughs> it's tough because, you know, there have been times when, for me, it posts, you know, staff turn and post um, law clerk where it's like, oh, I know this issue really well because I wrote an opinion on this. It's like, you know, I drafted an opinion on this, right? That little difference in language actually um, counts for a lot. And what, what is that all about? I mean, is this a lie? Is this dishonest in terms of talking about the process? And Bill, I really want to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> You've been very decorous, keeping your, your mouth shut. Not transparent. <laughs> Not transparent. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is so much about appearance. Um, I mean, it is a lie to some degree. We, you know, we basically have young attorneys around the country writing our law under the auspices of judges, um, who in turn are, you know, government employees who probably should be subject to more transparency <coughs> than they are. It's different than the other branches, for sure, right? I think a, an argument for the like say that the clerks and staff attorneys can't say wrote the opinion is that the judges are at least subject to some process like Justice Marquez was talking about mm -hmm. the retention process mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. you know it's not like Allison is ever up for retention but Justice Hobbs will be you know mm -hmm. so I mean there's that idea um, well it's also well, well, clerk works more than like a year or two there's like career clerks. There are career clerks and staff attorneys, so that's a little different. Um, but they're not subject, they're not accountable, so to speak. They're accountable to the judge, and the judge is accountable to the process. Yeah. Um, if I were to say, you know, if I were to go around saying, well, I wrote that opinion, you know, in this case or that case, what, what, in what sense would that statement be untrue? I think it takes a little bit of credibility out of it because you are not a judge or justice. Mm -hmm. and Maybe you did a lot of the legwork that went into the opinion, but the ultimate discretion is with the judge, and so, yeah, it's somewhat dishonest. I think that's the important thing to remember, you know, because it really can feel like, and I think, especially, you know, you know, I think our our DE grads are are generally, um, you know, pretty down to earth people. That you see some of these, you know, Harvard, Yale, uh, Stanford grads who really think that they are, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that they're all that. Right, because they're writing these, these opinions and kind of really can get sort of out of control in terms of, you know, their self-perception or whatever. And it's, you know, the judge is the one, is the person making the decision, right? And even if you totally set up the whole situation, the judge is like, I don't know which way I want to go. You go into your research, you present the options, or you say, I really think it should come out this way. And even if the judge agrees with you, the judge makes the decision. The judge is responsible for the consequences of making the decision. Um, and so it really, even though you are contributing tremendously in terms of articulating the basis for the decision and doing the legwork and everything else, you know, it's just important to remember the, the nature of that relationship. Um, you know, I remember when I was, so how do you guys feel about ellipses? <laughs> and food booking. Because um, if you've ever like worked on you know either an article or, or um, on law review and sort of like do we need an ellipsis here or not right? Does anybody remember what the rule is? When you need an ellipsis for an omission versus not? Okay. Go ahead. Oh, I actually have like my own personal story because I took advanced legal writing oh. in this, or last year, and I had worked at a firm and I was a paralegal, and so that partner who was like 
on Columbia Law Review and was like super, like the blue book was his Bible. He told me to read Strike and White once a year. Uh -huh. He like was very literal <laughs> with the ellipsis rule and he was like, anytime it's not exactly the same, put an ellipsis. But then with my advanced legal writing professor, she had a more liberal reading. She was like, I don't think you need ellipses here. And I was like, I do, and she like got out the blue book, and I think it's like subject to, it's not. Well, it's all with the, the right. Blue the blue book's not like clear. clear. <laughs> a word or words, omission of a word or words. Always. In, in the <laughs> middle okay, of the sentence, well, yeah. In the middle of the sentence, you need the ellipsis. In the beginning, you don't. Yeah, you just do the bracket. Yeah, you just bracket yeah. at the beginning, at the end. But also, it depends on whether you use the quotation as a sentence on its own or as a phrase, right? Um, so. It pretty obscure stuff, but the, the point being that there was a staff attorney at the Vermont Supreme Court who was writing a big constitutional school funding case and quoted a provision, I think it was a constitutional provision, in a situation where the ellipsis was not, ellipsis was not required. At the beginning and end, because it was quoted at the phrase. end. Mm -hmm. And um, there was uh, like public outrage in, <laughs> in Vermont. And if people in Vermont really pay attention to what the Supreme Court is doing. There's a lot of sort of community resonance there. But um, the, you know, people made accusations. There was this whole debate in the newspaper about the court misleading the public. But she didn't include the ellipsis and they thought she should have. Yeah, well. Something important was left out. Yeah, like there was a, there's some language that arguably could have been interpreted a different way, you know? And, you know, again, I mean, that staff attorney paid some consequences. He kept his job, but that didn't fall on the staff attorney who drafted the opinion. That wow. fell on the justice whose name was at the bottom of the opinion, you know. And I think in that case it was per curiam, so it was, it was everybody, you know, joining in this effort or whatever. Which is just, you know, it just kind of points to this other aspect of being in the public eye, you know. And I think in some ways it's more true for the state courts than for the federal courts, um, kind of depending on the issue. But the state courts are really, you know, more tied into their community, right? Um, in a sense, and people are watching, and there is, you know, again, sort of that temptation to maybe talk about a case, you know, people are writing about it in the newspapers or, or what have you, um, and that maybe is another reason for, you know, in defense, the idea of decorum, right, is that there's such a spotlight, in a sense, on the workings of the court that you need to have a little lack of transparency to be able to go through the messy process of, of actually getting things done, okay? Um, so confidentiality came from you, so <coughs> going down the line. What, was there a major sort of takeaway? Um, I thought her explanation of how they divided the opinions was really fascinating, mm -hmm. and the order that they were on the table. It's not great. that differs from yeah. <laughs> different courts. Um, yeah. But I had, there were a couple things that she mentioned, like um, how well-reasoned their initial comments were as being a basis for whether they're signing the opinion or not. I guess I hadn't really thought about that. It's like a competition. I kind of thought of it as a little bit more of a random process. <laughs> um, it depends on the court, but yeah. yeah. So that, I thought that was really fascinating. Um, and, well, yeah, yeah. The, the whole kind of discussion. Do they, have, do they have party affiliation or not at the Supreme Court level? I don't think On the ballot, sure. I don't yeah. think so. No. I mean, I think like when you talk to people, yeah. Yeah. But, well, I mean, yeah. And I mean, the article that I had dealt with that, but it was all because of the presidential appoint, appointee. But I don't think right, right. They look behind. It. Right. So there's a sense of so and so is you know a liberal right. or conservative, but, but it's not. A destination to the actual judge. Did you guys have any sense of Justice Marquez's politics? Not, not from what she said. Yeah. She was so no. Right. I mean, I, I really again, I think that I mean, she's not tipping her hand. I would. Be terrible. But if you just see which. <laughs> yeah. But if you just see which governor appointed them, I guess you know. Yes. Potentially slightly it, Yeah, and that's the thing, though. I think about the Judge Ebell, you know, especially one of the judges that I worked with who was, I think, a Reagan, a Reagan appointee, and who, um, I, I just don't think that the fact that he was a Reagan appointee really had any predictive value in terms of how he approached things, because he had this very fair, sort of tempered, you know, judicial um, mindset. And not, you know, and some judges, I think, are more partisan than others, but I think it's really nice to see a judge aspiring to not you know, projecting, you know, I'm going to rule a certain way on particular issues or whatever. But so I think there's variation. I mean, that's in, in this type of literature that you're referring to, it is used as a proxy. And again, that's to me something I find you know, offensive is kind of an overstatement, but it's sort of, I think is, um, 
insensitive to the variations in judicial temperament. And the evolution and maturation of judges yeah, on the court. the amount of time they've been on the court. Right? Right. So, Kira. My takeaways were more like personal. They weren't yeah. like big overviews, but... No, it's all good. This is all... All these levels are good. Yeah. Um, I like... I mean, it was helpful to hear from Justice Marcus, even though I've heard it before, but just to, like hearing it from her to start with the books, because like mm -hmm. since we're... You know, we all are accustomed to Westlaw online and Lexus. Especially from someone as young as her. Yeah. It's kind of more... You know, it's like, like if you're 70, like if you're old, 70, it's, yeah, you're like, yeah, yeah, but she's, yeah, and, like, just her story about her clerk kind of spinning herself into circles, because the it's, annotations aren't as clear online, and you, like, find yourself clicking, and then you're like, where am I? I've been clicking for three hours, <laughs> yeah. whereas the book, yeah. you just have it, and I, t I have heard that before, but it's a good reminder. It's, I think it's great, and really, now even, you know, I assume the students have not had experience with the books. I think my class in law school that was the last class where it was mandated mm -hmm. that you not use electronic research in your first semester and only use the books, and I think that just went by the wayside. Um, but the, the thing that is missing from electronic research is a sense of the structure of the law um, oh, yeah. and sort of how it relates, right? And all, everything kind of becomes sort of two-dimensional. And when you go to the books, it emphasizes the hierarchy of legal authority, the different types of sources and things like that. Um, and so I think I think that's excellent advice. Uh, it is really old fashioned, but that's the thing too. When you guys go through your clerkships, you're going to have the luxury of really getting good at um, working, you know, researching, working with the law, and it's going to differentiate you from other, you know, law school graduates, um, which is kind of part of the idea. Um, so it's a really great opportunity, actually, to figure out the right way to do things before you go into practice. And it also can create friction. I've talked about this before, I think, but, you know, private practice sometimes is really messy. <laughs> and when you come in and you're like, this is the right way to do things, we really need to think about this ellipsis, you know, there might be some, <laughs> there might be some friction around that. Um, but also a related point about working with librarians and just, you know, people who understand, lawyers who understand the value of librarians really um, can can up their game as a result of that. Yeah. Um, to go to kind of the last thing she said, was just that point about um, just because smart people haven't seen the yes. issue doesn't mean that issue doesn't exist. Yeah. And that kind of self-doubt I would think you would have, especially at the beginning of a clerkship, and thinking, well, somebody else would have noticed this, so I'll just keep quiet about it because it's probably stupid, which I think is an easy default to That's go to. So you know? Yeah, yeah. And especially those recent law graduates were like, what do we know? We just took the bar, right. and you've been yeah. on the bench for X number of years. Yeah. But that's, you know, you're sort of the eyes and ears, and I think that's kind of understanding your role, because your role is not to know the law. I mean, the judges still don't, there's certain areas of law, they don't know well, they have to research. You know, I think uh, sometimes there's this mythology that, like, Lawyers, especially good lawyers, experienced lawyers, kind of have everything <laughs> here. You know, now it's about learning how to use resources, um, being detail oriented. That's huge. Uh, you know, that's something that your judge is really going to rely on you for. Is for you to to look at the details and the whole. Stu I think the stupid question issue is a really important one because it's not that they're stupid questions. It's that they're questions that one has not thoroughly sort of examined before asking. <laughs> so if you can figure out something on your own or create a better context for asking the question, that is incumbent upon you to do that. Um, but, you know, d don't hesitate to ask a question on a sort of unexamined assumption that, that it's a stupid question. Um, and I, I know I've told this story before, but the this case that was in the Vermont Supreme Court for two years and multiple different justices and law clerks had worked on it and then they asked me to try to clean it up and I was like, call me crazy, but this was on 12b6. And so the standard of review is totally different than what we've applied and that it ended up, you know, this massive draft ended up being a half page order at the end of the day. So, and she told the story about the jurisdiction <laughs> issue. I mean, that happens, these are really complicated cases. Um, and again, your job is just to be attentive, to be thorough, you know, to be smart, um, and also to, to communicate. And the, the tone of communication is different in every chambers, you know. Yeah. 
Um, going off Bill's point, just that our former Justice Martinez just came to my advanced criminal law class, mm -hmm. and he, so he talked a little bit about the justice clerk relationship, which was really wonderful. But he told nice. a really good story that um, he said whenever he on his clerk's first day, he would say, "I'm sure you're sitting there nervous, and I bet you're wondering." when I'm going to find out that I made a mistake in hiring you. And he's like, and I'm not saying that because I think I made a mistake. I'm really sure of my hiring process and it served me very well. But as a new clerk, I think every clerk feels that way. And he was like, you're going to feel that way. And then once you start getting comfortable and feeling like you're the justice and you don't need me, that's when it's time for you to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, it's interesting. You think about the three years of law school, and I don't know if you guys reflect on it much, but the tra I mean, I see it all the time working with you know one L's to three L's. That transformation, your clerkship year is a really rapid transformation too, from that kind of insecurity and doubt to a sense of confidence. Um, so, I mean, it's going to be great. You guys are going to have a great experience. It's very, very cool to think about. Um, anything else in, in reflecting on, on that visit? Anything that you hadn't thought about before that maybe came up? I have one more thought about transparency and the videotaping. Or I, I'm just really, really interested in that. Yeah, yeah. What did you think? You know, I'm really inclined to think that all proceedings before court should be publicly available. And I personally would love if more oral arguments were taped so that I could observe them, you know, as a young attorney. Mm -hmm. But when she mentioned about like cutting it into clips and taking things out of context and putting it in political ads, I thought, oh my god, that's so dangerous. It is true. And it's dangerous. I, but I don't know how you do like fifty percent. How you choose some to tape, some not, you know, and, and well, and the, to me, it's always what's the principle because my yeah. instinct really g goes there too. You know, again, having been in the courts and having this sense of confidentiality. Mm -hmm. that almost is, it can be overdone sometimes but like having this instinct of that's not a good idea you know it's not a good idea at all but then trying to justify it mm -hmm. um, and what is the difference between a written transcript an audio tape and a videotape so they're so different why should it matter so I think body language says a lot I think facial expressions say a lot mm -hmm. and that's more likely to be abused than just like a written transcript because you know I, I I think the judges should be very responsible for the words that come out of their mouth during any court proceeding. So on a, tr on a transcript level, of course, but then you start thinking about like, you know, who's slumping over their chair, who's like, you know, right, those, those are invalid. Like, yeah, those are invalid considerations, yeah. right? But in our society, we're so public, you know, so appearance oriented, like mm -hmm. physical appearance oriented, that people might yeah. sort of take that to be more significant. But I would love to be able to see more tape or arguments, see how the attorneys perform, and see how that yeah. you know goes back and forth without having to physically be there. And so I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not technically meant to be a resource for like young lawyers, but at the same time, well, it could be a really good one. It, it, it could be, and the best, you know, the best thing you can do when you have a chance, you guys are all going to be busy, but sit in mm -hmm. on those arguments and sort of, I mean, and, and then again, you'll be a huge asset to your next employer if, if you end up litigating because you can see very clearly the difference between an effective advocate and you know, an ineffective advocate, right? What that made me think of a lot was the danger for a judge then to play with ideas Especially like the appellate stuff, where they're they're just like posing a hypothetical, mm -hmm. or they're playing devil's advocate, or you know all of these things, and then you pull that out into a thirty-second commercial right. Right. when they're yeah. up for retention, yes. yeah. and it's like, well, prove to me, blah blah blah, you know, whatever they're playing. Why with should women have the vote? You know, or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, there is a lobbyist group, and then they can't battle yeah. it. They can't. That was interesting. Yeah, they can't defend yeah. themselves. Yeah. 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 They can't so, even make a public statement really about it. People ask me during elections, they're like, what should I do with the judges? I'm like, look at the manual, you know, and gener generally vote them up. But I have friends who are just like, no, get them out. I'm like, no, you don't understand. But I mean, it's so hard. I think the judiciary really has to be independent. And when they're subject to these retention votes, especially when you have, I guess, this one person who really, mm -hmm. you know, goes after them, that's, that's a tough situation. I mean, there was a lot of speculation here that Justice Malarkey's you know, retirement timing mm -hmm. had a lot to do with mm -hmm. there being a strong campaign against mm -hmm. her. But, but it kind of goes to, like to me, that playing with ideas and stuff kind of goes to why confidentiality is so important. And, you know, in that relationship between you and the judge, there has to be this trust where they, 
they have that ability to play with those ideas. I like that. I like that explanation a lot. And when those things come out sort of half baked or when they're just going back and forth on something, it's like you want them to go through that process, mm -hmm. but then it can seem like equivocating or randomness mm -hmm. or take away kind of the power of the rule of law when it's like, oh, well, this stuff isn't certain at all. It's mm -hmm. Maybe they'll just make a rule that you have to play five minutes of it if you want to post it publicly. So <laughs> that would be fast. So that would be good commercials out of that. <laughs> uh, well, so, and that's, that's interesting, too, and I'll get you a second, Kara, that there is a messiness about the deliberative process that's really different than the final product. And it actually doesn't degrade the quality of the final product. It improves yeah, it, but taken out of context, it can appear, you know, to undermine. The, that authority or that correctness or what have you. I mean, that, that if you look at this in the if the transparency decorum conundrum in the context of sort of discourse theory, it takes on a whole different dimension. And actually, I think it's a good a good explanation. Yeah, it's actually a different topic. Don't go so ahead. Yeah. Can we go back to the professors thing a little bit? Like, yes. I just completely understand. Like, if you have a mentor, mm -hmm. like that you worked with over the summer at a firm, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be talking mm -hmm. to that attorney right. about your judge. Right. But I feel. I mean, I feel like professors are somewhat situated differently, but I know you always have to be careful. I guess... Let's think of a hypothetical. I mean, so, well, my question is, I'm just worried about my isolation. Like, I don't have a co-clerk. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have the judicial assistant, and I think I mean, she seems really great, but mm -hmm. she'll have a much different relationship with the judge than I will, since she's worked with him for, like, mm -hmm. 30 years. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, like, who... Mm -hmm. Who to talk to? Mm -hmm. Or like, who, I mean, you know, it's like this is all like who not to talk to. Don't talk to anyone ever. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, but just like from a realist, like I don't know what. Okay, well, let's think of a couple strategies. Okay, so first of all, would you feel comfortable asking your judge? Yeah, I guess it depends on what. It, yeah. Well, and it was like Justice Marquez's advice was: we'll talk to your co-clerks to make sure it's not a stupid question and yeah. then go to your judge. And then she's like, well, of course, <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean. I think that was kind of dry. I've heard that and I knew that when I interviewed with him. But then hearing it from Justice Marcus, mm -hmm. I was like, oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then I emailed her a thank you and she emailed me back and she's like, you'll have a wonderful and challenging year. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's great. No, it's true. It's true. But it's definitely, you know, it will be wonderful. It will be wonderful. Um, so whether to even ask the question, right, is kind of the first issue, and I think you can probably feel that out, you know, in your early conversations or what have you, or be like, oh, what do you think about the process of talking through ideas, and what's, you know, as a sole clerk, like, how might I do that, or whatever. But what, okay, give an example of something it would clearly be okay to talk to a former professor about, and an example of something that would clearly not be okay. Any of you? Jump in. I, I think like you know just some treatise treatise level question where it's like you know I'm thinking about this area of law mm -hmm. and you know there's you know this mm -hmm. concern and this concern and what do you think about this Policy balance or so whatever. So not that's like attached to part, parties' arguments, yeah. and not attached to facts of the case. Right. I mean, those are yeah. two major qualities of what you're talking about. Okay, something clearly impermissible. We're trying to deduce a rule here, a principle oh. for figuring this out. Parties of the case. Go on. Uh, pretty much the opposite of what. Okay. What would be so what would what would be? I mean, you don't want to drop parties of the case or who's deciding. On the question of law, mm -hmm. or no? Is that okay? I'm calling you, Professor Marceau, to ask about this Fourth Amendment question, and I'm Justice Hobbs' clerk, but, yeah, and this he, case is pending. Well, he would probably we should win. be able to deduce those two separate <laughs> questions, though, right? Yeah. It's like I wrote you a letter for <laughs> Justice Hobbs, and I know you accepted it, so I don't yeah. think you're calling for your like side night job. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I now know before anybody else who's assigned the majority opinion, or maybe the dissent. 
Yeah, that's, yeah. So it seems like you can't even ask any legal question at this point. She's just asking her an amicus brief of some sort. Real quickly, this is Real quick. Real quick. <laughs> Why are all of Will's professors all of a sudden submitting <laughs> amicus <laughs> briefs? <laughs> 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 that would be great. That's great. Well, so judges themselves can reach out for some. From professors? Yeah. If if they if they disclose it to the parties. If they disclose it to the parties. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Um, How bad would that look if you're the judge? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'm not really sure. <laughs> so yeah, I mean again, if we think about the trickle downs or legal ethics thing, right? Um, you're so, I mean all this sort of, you know, it's exaggerated this idea that you're just you're there with the judge's brain, your brain, the briefs and the record. And no, you know, outside influence. Maybe, and I'm not, I haven't really thought about this, but maybe one of the answers is, you know, distinction between merits and process questions, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but yeah, you need to think about if, if I ask this question, will it tip the hand in terms of, you know, who's working on this case? Right. And if it's something like Lobato or something, like, the professor's going to know all. <laughs> all the facts and stuff anyway and how your question fits in and you know if it's something more obscure they mm -hmm. they wouldn't necessarily yeah no, that's right that's right but I think I think it's trickier than it looks like at first blush and I think um, I mean look at it this way too clerking is not without its hardships we need kind of know what your hardship is going to be do you have any sense of something that might be challenging um I asked Judge Jones, what he thought the hardest part about clerking for him was, and he he thought that the thing people struggle with most is that he's pretty quiet and doesn't have a lot of direct communication with his clerks. Okay. Um, and he thought that frustrated some people. Yeah. And then do you think you'll be able to deal with that, or because that kind of echoes a little bit of what you're looking at? Um, yeah, I'll have well, I have a senior co-clerk who's been there a year. Yeah. Which is really nice. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm kind of an introvert at heart, too, so I don't think that it will affect me a whole lot. Okay. Whereas someone who really wanted that feedback and the contact might be a little bit harder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I'll have a similar problem. Um, Justice Hobbs' clerks last year told me that because he is one of the more senior justices and is very involved in a lot of mm -hmm. organizations, but he's not in chambers as much as other Justices. That can be really frustrating. Yeah, that, that can be really frustrating for some courts. Yeah. So. And that he is almost to an extreme amount of micromanager, which I think I prefer, mm -hmm. but is that it can be difficult to get feedback. Yep. Okay. So you have to really seek it out, mm -hmm. um, which I think will be a challenge. Okay, okay. Uh, going into it, I think I have similar thoughts, just like availability of view in front, mm -hmm. in front of the judge, but I don't know, I think there's going to be enough clerks or people around that I can kind of bounce ideas yeah. off that'll have a, an idea. Of Do you know anything about your co-clerks? Not yet. Okay. But there's a... Because that could be a real challenge. Yeah, that, I mean, that, could be, that actually could probably be more of a challenge than yeah. the judge not being around because he's getting along with the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know your co-clerk? Um, I don't know her yet, yeah. but I'll have lunch with her sometime soon. Okay, and then you have... I've met mine. They seem great. Okay. They're really great. Yeah. Very, the, the two of them are polar opposites, and I'm curious kind of how I fit into the mix yeah. here. One is very passive, kind of like hippie environmental, and then uh -huh. there's the uh, editor-in-chief of the CU Law Review, and she was like directing the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I was like, yeah. okay, well, <laughs> see how this goes. All right. <laughs> Interesting. And the best thing about the clerkship of anything that's bad is over after you. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> uh, okay, so let's just talk a little bit about the writing process coming up, and thank you for your talk <coughs> in this conversation. It's really helpful, really interesting. For me. Um, the so the main thing I noticed from our conference is a lot of people were still like, I don't, I'm not 100 percent sure which way I wanted to go. So after spring break, you want to know which way you're going to go. Now, not necessarily the ultimate outcome, but which analytical path that you're going to take. Um, and the you know, I haven't really talked that much about the research aspect. I don't really want you guys doing a ton of research, but you're going to have a you know, sort of discrete body of cases that you need. You're, you know, you're going to have to read, identify, print those out, read them. You know, be familiar with them. Um, maybe outline them if that's something that that helps helps you. Um, and then for our class meeting after spring break on March 25th, 
What I would like is for each of you to have at least tried to develop a topic sentence outline of your, um, the, the thrust of your argument, okay? So not the sort of, you know, introductory sections, procedural stuff, or whatever, but really your analysis. And that's gonna be painful. It's going to force you to really think through how you're going to approach it, and particularly the sequencing of the different ideas. And to get us thinking about that, um, and is anyone gonna see Alexis? Uh, maybe. I, I okay, okay. If you, I mean, whatever. Friends. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can print in that site. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, but, but I want you actually to do some outlining on it right now. Oh, okay. If that's okay. 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 So, what I want you to do, so you guys are familiar with Cleaver and kind of have a sense of it, it's a really um, powerful case, a really well written case, I think. Um, if you flip to page, that's 3254 in the Supreme Court Reporter. Okay, and again, reading these cases will also get you in that rhythm of, you know, here, the procedural posture is <coughs> with we grant search for art, okay? Roman numeral two, the equal protection clause does X, Y, or Z, okay? Transition to illegal analysis. So what I would like for you to do um, is to just read and highlight the first sentence of each paragraph in sections Roman numeral two and Roman numeral three, okay? Or highlight or underline whatever happens to work. Okay, here's an equal protection rule statement. Yeah. Does <laughs> anybody need a highlighter? Well, that's interesting. also expert readers when you read all those briefs you're going to have very clear standards about what's good for brief writing and what's bad for brief writing all right sorry Yeah, I I, mm -hmm. you got them. Okay. I saw your email like I'm gonna follow along. So sorry, I forgot. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
All right, just because we're running out of time, we'll kind of fast forward this. Um, observations? Well, like Will said, I mean, the first sentences are pretty good topic sentences. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. it easy. And yeah. I don't think that that's the case with all no, opinions. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I definitely think over the, the decades, you know, some of the earlier opinions that people tend to read as first years in law school, unfortunately, um, are just incredibly disorganized and, you know, um, rambling and what have you. And I think there's definitely, you can see sort of progress over time. Um, that clarity is something that you want to strive for, okay? And what is it, what are these topic sentences communicating? What's the meaning of communicating Role, but also what the paragraphs are talking yeah, about. exactly. Okay, so the topic sentence is giving you both substantive information, but it's also signaling to you this is what this paragraph is about. Okay, so it not only creates a pleasant reading experience for the reader, but it helps the author to formulate his or her thoughts and make sure that you know you know what you are saying and why. Especially when I used to teach first year legal writing, and I would have students in my office and I'd be like, what are you saying? And they would just sort of sit there. I mean, they're struggling so much with vocabulary mm -hmm. and stuff, right? But you really want to know what you're saying and why, and that's going to determine, you know, the sequence and content, obviously, of your topic sentences, okay? So just to look at this for a, section, uh, for a second, um, a general rule of the Equal Protection Clause, okay, it obviously makes sense to go, if you're thinking even about IRAC and domestic IRAC structure, you're going from the big picture to, ideally, you're going from the big picture down to the more detailed and specific analysis, okay? Then, and the thing is, what you can do with these topic sentence outlines is you can read the topic sentences themselves in isolation, and it tells a story that makes sense, okay? So the Equal Protection Clause does this, okay? And I expect some elaboration on that point in this paragraph, second paragraph. The general rule gives way, however, when a statute classifies by race, alienage, or national origin. What? You don't know the details. I mean, if you you know if you know the legal protection law, you kind of know the details. But um, that topic sentence reaches back to the prior paragraph. Okay, so I know either the general rule he's talking about, either that's the rule stated at the beginning, or else it's elaborated upon in that paragraph. And in fact, it's elaborated upon in that paragraph, which is the idea that in general. The court, you know, hands off def deference, right? But there's an exception, and the first exception is applies applies to race. Okay, legislative classifications based on gender also call for a heightened standard of review. The also points back at the prior paragraph and establishes this very nice flow through those three paragraphs. Okay, we have declined, however, to extend heightened review to differential treatment based on age. Um, Okay, general purpose of the Equal Protection Clause, general standard, the race exception, the gender exception, the limiting principle when it comes to those exceptions, okay? And explaining why age um, <clears throat> is not a suspect classification. Finally, the lesson of Mergia is that where individuals in the group affected by a law have distinguishing characteristics relevant to interest, da 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 da, da okay? The lesson of Mergia, okay, the court is distilling mm -hmm. the point of all this here. And the reason why you know, this this is a treatise. I mean, Claiborne is a very important case because it's really one of the clearest explanations of what suspect classification analysis and heightened scrutiny is really all about, okay? So that, in terms of the topic sentences and the paragraphs presenting these really clear rules of law, that's exactly, because that's the function here, okay? What's happening then in section three? Looking, we're applying those yeah. general standards to the facts that are specific to this case. Okay, so rule application. Okay, against this background, this background being the law, um, we conclude for several reasons: court erred in holding mental retardation a quasi-suspect classification. Da 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 da. And then you see that first. So even that's though that's not the, the um, <clears throat> and that could have been a new paragraph, but it's very clearly signaled. Okay for several reasons, and then you go through a number of them. I mean, this is, you know, I mean, in some ways it's kind of manipulative because enumeration gives the sense of logic, even if logic's not really present, um, but it's really good legal writing practice, okay? But multiple reasons for this. First, second, 
Um, and then there's sort of a new paragraph, but you know it's not third, because it's not labeled third, right? It's a further elaboration on the point before. Um, then third, fourth, and then there's the um, sort of explanation. And let's look at the substance of this, okay? So first, signaling that now the court is transitioning to application. This is our ultimate conclusion, and I'm going to give you the reasons in support of this conclusion, okay? Um, First, they have a reduced ability to cope and function in the everyday world. The paragraph then explains that. Second, distinctive legislative response. Lawmakers have been addressing this, okay? Next paragraph, such legislation. Well, that tells me what the court just did in the prior paragraph was go through this protective legislation, okay? So again, whether you're reading or skimming, you are understanding the, the, what is going on, what's being presented both content-wise and structurally in this part of the opinion, okay? Third, the legislative response also has this other effect. It negates any claim that they're politically powerless, which is a problematic ar argument on the merits level, but you can at least tell what the court is saying. Um, fourth, we have the problem of this being a large and amorphous class, okay? And then you kind of get the sense that, that the reasons are over. Doubtless, there have been and there will continue to be instances of discrimination. What, what's the point of having this paragraph? I've just given you four reasons, amply supported, for why the mentally retired are not a suspect class. What is, what is, what is this paragraph doing? I'm kind of saying that in some cases there's, they may have returned in other cases, maybe. Okay. So. Parents. Okay. I think the court's addressing the response. I'm saying, yes, we know that this, I mean, we're not saying that they're, um, they should get strict scrutiny, but mm -hmm. yeah, there still will be discrimination. Mm -hmm. But we just told you why we're deciding the way we are. So it's mitigating a little bit. Mm -hmm. We'll be out in a second. It's mitigating a little bit the, what it just, uh, the sort of analysis it just presented. So it doesn't seem too one-sided. Yeah, it's it's, sort it's, of cold-hearted. Yeah. Seems like they're showing that they at least considered the other side and just came down on the side for good reason. Okay, and then the last paragraph, really pretty critical in terms of this opinion's role in the jurisprudence. Our refusal to recognize the retarded as quasi-suspect class does not leave them entirely unprotected from invidious discrimination. Okay, and they're saying, we're applying rational basis review, but that's not a meaningless standard. Of course, it is a meaningless standard, <laughs> but not in this case, you know, apparently. What's the point of me showing this to you? <clears throat> well, I think for our assignment, for after break, this is what we want to see the topic. It, it's a really, it's difficult, because you really have to think through stuff, but it's a very, I think, very empowering way to write, and it leads to a sort of clarity in your writing and a sort of conviction that, that makes it really effective, in my view. Um, so what it will do is it will force you guys up doing the hard work of really thinking through every step of the analysis. And topic sentences are appropriate because legal analysis is really organized by paragraphs, right? Each paragraph should have a function, it have, should have a substantive point, and a function within the analysis. So, you know, this is a great opinion. That was what, you know, 10 topic sentences. I mean, it doesn't have to be super long necessarily. Any questions about that? Yeah. A lot of these sentences are way too long in my mind. Um, Why? Yeah, I was getting tired reading them. I, yeah. A little bit, my throat's a little bit dry. <laughs> um, Why do people write long sentences? Because they didn't spend enough time to write short ones. <laughs> no, that's a lot of sense of that. They think they have to write long sentences because they're conveying complex concepts. Okay. Um, being able to reduce that down to something more simple and straightforward, I mean, that's a tremendous skill. It's a skill that lawyers really lack. These lawyers think it's so complicated, I can't reduce it down. Well, really, you didn't try, right? You didn't do that any work. I think aspiring to more concise topic sentences is great, but they have to be complete. They that's have to tell question. me exactly yeah. what you're doing in that paragraph. I mean, because to me, if you're over 25 words in a sentence, you have to be a you're, master of you're something. Really, yeah, you're really compromising communication at that point. But then, can you can you do that while having a substantive rule and describing the direction of the paragraph? Yeah, 
I think, so some of these, I think the shorter ones are more powerful, right? They're more, are certainly more clear. And I think, for example, the first sentence under Roman numeral three could have, you know, it's, it's hard because anytime you write about suspect classifications, you talk about the associated heightened scrutiny, and so the court's kind of doing that thing here. Could that be two sentences? Yeah, it could. And that might be a little bit more powerful. But is that kind of the trade off? Like, if you want to. There's a trade off between completeness of information versus, you know, comprehensibility. So you'll have to find that kind of balancing point. I would start kind of blurting everything out and then um, have some, you know, do some um, sort of intentional editing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or, like, I mean, well, I guess he's really on like quoting language in one. So it's not the quoted language that's making them long. No, but that can happen sometimes. Like that would seem like an easy way to, you know, summarize and then give the quoted language, but. Yeah, you don't, I mean, you've got to be careful with quoted language that you don't have it doing too much work for you. You need to sort of assert your own point in your own language um, and then use the quoted, I mean, oftentimes quoted language just throw into a footnote, right? So I think that's a fair question. You have questions? I have a question. Yeah. So I'm trying to knock some of those out during spring break. How do you want us to approach, or what is the correct way to approach citing to the Ninth Circuit, the district court opinions, and the briefs? Do you want us to put in page sites to everything that we're talking um, about? You know, typically, I mean, so typically um, in a draft opinion, you would include all the record citations mm -hmm. and citations to the brief, but then you would, so they could be site checked, mm -hmm. but then you would take those out okay. prior to publishing. So, so I'm not gonna site check your stuff. So I, mean, I don't have a problem if you don't put in citations to um, the briefs, okay. um, but you should have- we're allowed to characterize our arguments, we have a little bit of leeway with that, right? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. I think I was more thinking about, since I'm gonna get into rational basis review and the sort of Factual record from the trial court. Yeah. Um, ha, I mean, how? Just cite to the page number of the trial court. Okay. Don't cite to the record citation okay. within the trial court's decision because okay. that would just be kind of painful. Um, yeah. So then on Monday after spring break, we're bringing our time bring, sentence outline. Yes, bring it here and we're going to talk about it, give you some feedback and stuff like that. Um, and then there's oral argument. For the next two days, um, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be something else. So Professor Smith and I are going down to see you next Wednesday to talk to them a little bit about the amicus brief that we filed and kind of like what's gonna happen. And I mean, things are gonna get really interesting. And you guys are you know really experts on this stuff, um, so you can you know throw it around at at cocktail parties and what have you. <laughs> oh, I should tell you about. Didn't call her out. Happy hour conversation I had with the uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to the governor, I guess. Um, yeah, the, some of the, the, your professors here are my friends on Facebook, and there's divergent views as to whether this is a wonderful okay. thing or a okay. terrible thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird how these states are all kind of going about this in a different order or process. But. It is really, well, this article that I, this essay that I just, um, is going to be published um, shortly after the oral arguments, basically says, you know, how much does the legislative history in a given state affect the constitutionality of whatever their marriage regime is, you know, because you have these states that have comprehensive civil unions, you have these states that have limited civil unions, a lot of different variations. What were you going to tell about? Oh, I was going to say I had a very long, kind of tipsy, happy hour conversation with some of my friends about this topic. And were they blown away by the level of your knowledge? <laughs> They're like, what? I don't even know. So we got into like the standing issue. I don't even know why. But they like couldn't wrap their mind around the California statute saying that the proponents of an initiative can have standing to defend it in the place of the state. That was like yeah. mind boggling. Really? And I'm like, it is kind of mind boggling when you think about it. Well, the level, I mean, even, and I'm curious when we talk to the folks at CU, because I think even, like, law professors who are not in this area, I mean, the level of common knowledge of, like, what is really going on with these cases yeah. is oh, pretty yeah. limited. Yeah. yeah. So. But they, they were both of the opinion that suspect class. So, so I don't know. Well, well yeah, there's sort of two things, like, okay, does, how does it look against the criteria, if you accept the criteria? Mm -hmm. If you don't accept the criteria, how does mm -hmm. it look? 
And then a totally separate question of, does the court want to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, which might be the sort of the greatest influence of all. But mm -hmm. I'm, so, I'm just so interested because I don't think we'll know for sure what direction we're going to take after oral argument. It'll be interesting to see the little clues in there. You know, and I, I'm hoping they're going to talk about animus. Um, Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, have an awesome break. And you can email me anytime with questions and stuff. Thank you. Yeah, Bill, you're going to go along with Judge Jones because he loves short sentences. <laughs> Does he? Yeah. Okay. The quicker you can say something, the better. Is that talk fast? Um, That's up to the summer beards. I think she wanted to go early. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember him having a beard. No, he's in Rock and Roll Smasher. This is nice. Oh, well. Mark would have a new addition. Oh, she was in a hurry, wasn't she? Oh, good. Out of time. Oh, yeah. I think she has some of us in Austin. Jesus. I like <laughs> <laughs> like She's the first one. Russell, yeah. <laughs> they were just like, I was like, oh, we'll stick around for hours as long as you want until you understand this stuff. Come up with questions. And he's just like, you're third year, so you see it. <laughs> you should know this by now. There's legal protection clause, though. The standard is kind of a bit more.